Okay, can everyone see the screen well? Yes. Okay, great. So my name is David Foote. I'm the founder and CEO of Xenia. Xenia is a mobile healthcare company that focuses on leveraging technology to deliver, to deliver healthcare uh, at the home and the office. And actually, you know, we're, we're a complete platform that provides end-to-end -end services around uh, nursing, telemedicine, uh, as well as corporate care. So that's the that's really background of Xenia, and I can cover that a little bit at the end. So I'm going to start off with uh, giving a brief overview of lockdown, both from a technology perspective and from a healthcare perspective, and sort of dive into some of the areas we think are important. You know, first the issue is why, why do we lock down to begin with? The original focus of lockdown was to flatten the curve, to buy time so that the, the, comp the country could uh, mobilize capabilities around addressing COVID-related issues. Those would include access to ventilators, hospital beds, increasing mass testing. Um, ultimately, whether or not it worked, I, I think we don't know. Uh, there, there hasn't been enough testing statistically to be able to give us a gauge. Uh, what we do know is that as we look at the curve, this is the Philippines compared to the other countries within Southeast Asia, and this is fairly recent, uh, you'll notice that the, it's still rising. Uh, the rise is slow, uh, but it's still rising. Uh, and the caveat is that since we have not done a tremendously large number of tests in this country, I think there's still some questions about just how much we know about where the curve is. But two things that I want to point out in this graph, this, the success stories here are China and South Korea. You see that both of them have actually flattened the curve. Virtually nobody else has really flattened the curve here. Um, so to summarize here, we, we have limited information uh, at the moment, uh, but we know that we can't stay in lockdown much longer for uh, economic reasons. So when we look at the success stories, uh, in the case of, uh, in Asia in general, uh, compared to the Western countries, uh, there's been a greater usage of technology in battling COVID. And in particular, I want to zoom in on two of the success stories, the, the Chinese success story and the Korean. Uh, this quote I have here is from McKinsey. It's the Asians' use of technology that, that's been the major element relative to the speed of the region's response that's guarded the safe, uh, safeguard of the livelihoods. So this is, this is really a key point that we're going to discuss. And by the way, that's a real picture of a drone in China right now uh, going around with QR passes uh, for, for COVID-related issues. So when you look at China, their, their strategy has been focused on tracking and isolation uh, and, and health identification, uh, digital health ID. So in terms of tracking and isolation, they were very aggressive on immediately isolating anybody that they found COVID positive, and then they leveraged health IDs, which uh, through the government, everybody had to get. They have three codes, green, yellow, or red, uh, and that indicates your COVID status. So for example, uh, green is your asymptomatic, yellow is you might be suspect, uh, red is you're, you're definitely COVID positive and, and you need to be under quarantine. So the, a lot of their success has been based on uh, the, the capability of the government because it is a communist country to sort of enforce rules at all levels, uh, but they also have a very strong technology base that they brought to bear against this. And just one data point to share with you is this QR coded app that I want to show you has had over 6 billion visits within a month of release. So uh, a tremendous portion of their approach was to look at identifying who is and is not symptomatic uh, to, to try to control the spread of COVID. So next let's look at Korea. Uh, Korea is uh, an even more interesting success story for most democratic countries to look at because their model is not as, um, uh, as heavy handed, for example, as the, the Chinese model. In the case of Korea, they flattened the curve very aggressively and very quickly with an incredibly small number of uh, deaths, 260 so far. That, again, they use technology, uh, even in some ways more aggressive usage of technology than China. They coordinated all the telcos in the country to contact trace everybody and automatically alert everybody of any instance of a COVID positive uh, patient. Uh, so for example, what would happen is if you'd come into contact with someone that was found to be COVID positive and uh, that would alert anybody else who would come into that contact with that person, regardless of where they are. Then it would also alert the health authorities who would then go and start testing people in the areas around where they saw the greatest cluster of people reporting positive. So with a very aggressive means of uh, contact tracing, uh, they were able to perform uh, very targeted tests. 
But the other thing that they did that, that actually hasn't been replicated here either is massive PCR testing. They invested millions of dollars into uh, PCR testing to automate every aspect of it to reach levels that have allowed them to perform something like over 700,000 tests so far. So it's that combination of uh, mass testing. And, and by the way, in, in Korea, something like 80% of all the tests went to one laboratory. And the reason why is because this laboratory was outfitted with uh, such large scale automation around testing that they were capable of performing tests at you know, test scale. So that was a big element of their strategy is the mass testing as well as the mass contact tracing. All right. um, overall takeaway looking at comparing Korea and China is China's going to be hard to copy for most democratic countries because their, their approach was extremely heavy handed. They, they in fact boarded up some uh, condominiums for weeks at a time. Uh, but I think this, the best takeaway we have from China is that the, the that digital health ID was a good idea, is working, and has worked for them, and continues to work for them. Uh, Korea is a better model for, uh, for us to follow, but uh, the challenge with Korea is there was extreme technical capability with the telcos and very strong private sector, public sector uh, uh, cooperation, which I don't think we've seen here to that level, that enables them to provide that kind of mass level contact tracing. So we don't have that capability here. Uh, and the other challenge is the, the mass testing in terms of laboratories. Uh, no single laboratory here has yet made the investment that the Koreans made. So we don't have the, the speed and scale of testing there either. Um, though the last takeaway I do want to mention to, for Korea is I think that the targeted contact tracing is a good takeaway. So if we look at these two, uh, digital health passes and targeted contact tracing are two very important takeaways in terms of their, their strategies from a digital perspective. So now I want to dive into, uh, take a look at the Philippines um, in terms of the demographics and the population and talk about the, the other aspect here, which is health. So on the one hand, we have technology and then, you know, COVID is a health issue and there are health risks. So I want to address the health risks uh, as a means of risk mitigation. So this is from the, the Department of Health. If you look at the demographics of the Philippines, there's some interesting things to notice here. There's actually relatively few people who are 65 and above. Uh, the, the positive aspect of that is there's a very small segment of the population that is at the highest risk of mortality from COVID, and that's the elderly. Uh, the reason that the situation was so bad in Italy is it was something like 20, 25% of the population. Here, if you notice, it's actually less than 4%. Uh, but we do have some interesting dynamics behind the young, the, from zero through uh, age 24, that's about uh, 42%. And then the office workers that people I think we're addressing during this meeting comprise the bulk of the middle, and that's going to be around 38%. So back on the elderly, if you look at the COVID mortality by, by, by age range, if you see on the right end of the chart, something like, you know, the vast majority of COVID deaths globally have been within that 60 to 80 uh, year old range. And the good news for the Philippines is that's a very small segment of the population. So the strategy there really needs to be at all costs to isolate the, uh, the elderly, uh, but we, from, a, from an overall population demographic level, we don't have that significant of a population to be concerned about in terms of overall size uh, from a mortality perspective. Then the young. Now, the, the challenge with the young is the young are super spreaders. And the reason why is this. COVID doesn't affect, uh, the COVID symptoms are not as strong in the young as they are in older. And a lot of the dynamics of COVID as a virus, which are different from other viruses, are that they seem to have the greatest effect on pre-existing conditions. And the, the young generally don't have very many pre-existing conditions. But the insidious aspect here is that from a study in Israel, something like 33% of all COVID cases under nine were completely asymptomatic. So they didn't have fevers, they didn't have any obvious cough, but they were spreaders. So one of the challenges for the Philippines is that in that youngest age group, they're super spreaders because it's hard to tell who has it and who doesn't have it. Then I consider the teens social spreaders because once you get past the that 10 and under, between the ages of 10 and 21, for example, you're looking at people that are going to be more socially active and probably less uh, sort of conscious of wearing masks and social distancing. So. The risk we have there is that the young are, spread, uh, are an infection risk. So the old that I mentioned over the highest risk, but very, relatively few in number, 
Um, now, let's dive into office workers. So for the 38% that we're really targeting here, the people that are going to generally be working, the, the primary risk that we have to look at are pre-existing conditions, right? Because what's happened is that the death rates for COVID directly correlate with pre-existing conditions. And if you look at this map here, and this is from global death rates, the, the number one highest correlation for death rates of pre-existing conditions are heart disease, next diabetes, and next chronic respiratory disease, high blood pressure and cancer way down, uh, cancer is also on the list. But the, the ones that we're focusing uh, for office workers are the preventable lifestyle type illnesses. And then these also happen to be the leading causes of death in the Philippines. So the Philippines actually is uh, pretty high up there in terms of uh, obesity and heart disease and a number of other lifestyle risks. So I think for, from our perspective, from a healthcare perspective, that's one of the areas we need to be taking a careful look at in terms of risk prevention. So the bad news here, one in four Filipinos are obese. Um, and physical activity is generally very low amongst Filipinos in almost any capacity, right? One in four Filipinos are hypertensive, right? Um, nearly 50% of the Filipinos in early adulthood have high, pro, high, high blood pressure. A couple of interesting statistics to share here. Females are six, six times likely to have high waist to circumference ratios than males. And then um, a couple of missing statistics here that I wanted to go over were that what we found are the, the highest, the, sorry, the, the data that we have is that the people that are at highest risk of obesity and diabetes are actually well-to-do urban office workers and more skewed towards females than males. So from a health risk standpoint, as we look at return to work, there's a few different aspects we want to focus on. One is we have to classify the people by health condition to figure out who's at risk to determine who's safe to work at home and who's safe to come in the office. And that's an important area that I think is being sort of not looked at as carefully as it should by companies to identify those risk conditions. So next I'm going to talk a little bit about workplace safety. Uh, and uh, I'm going to, to talk about it in the context of some of the ways that we try to address this risk from Xenia. The, summarizing the previous areas we looked at, we believe that the solution for offices here really is sort of an end-to-end an -end approach to look at every aspect of healthcare in terms of identifying who can come to work from a health standpoint. And the approach that we've taken is similar to the Chinese approach I showed you before, which is to use digital healthcare passes as identifiers that access, you know, access the ability to enter the premise. And those would be performed by doing a daily online COVID screen that each employee would do through, through their mobile phone and linked to their company ID. And then link that this would be combined with a temperature check that would also be digitally linked back to their uh, corporate health information. And so between these two pieces of information, we get a sense of whether or not they're symptomatic or not and safe to enter the workplace. Um, uh, I'll speak about this more in the context of the overview rather than what we do, but the, the general issue here is this. Companies that are looking to safeguard their perimeters from a healthcare standpoint have to identify, number one, everybody who is uh, at high, medium, and low risk. Number two, for those who are at average or, or, or medium risks to come into the office, they need to be able to perform daily assessments of their ability to come in and guard that perimeter carefully. Now, from our perspective, this is a data issue, it's a tech issue, because with large companies or even with medium-sized companies, trying to manage hundreds or thousands of people with daily symptoms and whether or not they are in day one of quarantine or day seven of quarantine is going to be very difficult. Um, we believe that the solutions in place need to track not only symptoms and temperature, but also COVID testing results, uh, both for rapid testing and for PCR testing, then combine all those data points together to look at this from a technology and data, big data standpoint to be able to provide an overall risk mitigation strategy. Right. So next thing I want to look at is uh, lab testing. So it, I think the, a couple of things we'd like to address during this meeting because uh, we've seen in the, um, uh, a lot of confusion about testing and what testing means. So 
there's three types of testing to look at. There's the point of care testing. Those are the finger prick type tests. Uh, those are important tests to be able to determine um, uh, determine exposure uh, and current infection. Uh, the problem is that those tests are not uh, necessarily going to show any antibodies in the system until several days after infection. So someone might have contracted COVID today and five days later, they still haven't developed the antibodies. One of these finger prick tests would say they're negative, but they're not necessarily, they, they still have COVID. So it's an important thing to understand, it's a data point that has to be looked at in conjunction with daily symptom checking and other factors. It can't be looked at just by itself. The next around the, uh, the COVID uh, rapid antibody testing is it has to be done multiple times. So if you test your workforce today, you have to test your workforce again in one to two weeks in order to be able to continue to get data points because number one, because it might have missed someone who was already infected. Number two, because new infections pop up. So this is the continuous activity. There's another kind of test that is not well known here and should be released in the next week or two. That is a full blood test for COVID antibodies. That works a little bit differently than the cassette uh, type. That's not a finger prick. It's a venous blood test that is drawn from the blood similar to like a lipid panel or a CBC test. This would go to a laboratory. This test has extremely high sensitivity. It's over 99% but it only gives you one important piece of information. Do you have antibodies? Have you, developed, you, know, have you been exposed to uh, COVID and have you developed antibodies? These tests are actually complementary because the full blood test is much more accurate than the cassette test. Uh, and so when you look at these two together, it's a way to do confirmatory testing from the uh, rapid side to in, in order to determine whether or not someone has developed antibodies and is sort of safe to come back to work. The, in the last kind of test, the PCR test, I think that's the one everybody knows as well, the, the confirmatory test where it's a nasal swab that's then sent to a laboratory to perform the, the actual genetic testing to identify whether or not the COVID virus is present right now. Okay, so um, I think that I, I've, I've reached the, the end of my presentation. A couple points that I didn't raise uh, with uh, the solution that we look at and we propose is we propose a holistic solution, number one, looking at uh, pre-existing healthcare risks, uh, a targeted solution, looking at who can work in the office based on a constant assessment of their current symptoms. Uh, and then we believe in regular testing as a data point that can be combined with that. Uh, we think that the contact tracing is absolutely important as well. Uh, and this is actually something that we do offer in our platform. But the point that I wanna discuss in terms of contact tracing is that Contact tracing from uh, an overall population standpoint really only works if it is uh, prevalent. So for example, the Trace Together uh, program in Singapore only reached around 17 or 18% of the population. That's not enough to provide uh, enough density. It needs to be at least 60 to 70%. We think that workplaces are going to be able to solve this by targeted contact tracing in corporate apps. Uh, and that's because what companies can do is require that anybody who is going to come into work uh, uh, allow for their phones to contact trace them so that we can determine at least within the perimeter of the office who they've been in contact with and that facilitates rapid tracing and isolation of the individuals in the office. Okay, so uh, I think I, I get to pause here for questions, Q&A. Everyone, I'm back. <laughs> Thanks, David. That was a really interesting and uh, um, presentation full of data. Uh, there were some little bits that I missed, but um, um, I, I did. I hope that everyone got that. Um, we do have a very quick poll right now, which I, if uh, we could flash that just to get everyone re engaged. So the question is to work, to return or not to return? The question is to return or not to return? Is that the question? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> like to be or not to be. <laughs> to re return or not to return. Just a little levity in the middle. Um, let's see what, what everyone... Not to return. Interesting. Oh. 
How do you feel about that, David or Katie? Interesting. Your standpoint, you... <laughs> yeah. Let's see later because we're going to have another round of Paul after the talk. So let's see how it goes during our discussions right now. All right. Yeah. Thank you very much, um, just... David. No? I think we're going back to David later for some Q&A. We will. There's, there's no more Q&A now? There will be. We'll... Okay. Yeah, after this one, I suppose. So I think I should uh, start uh, sharing my screen as well. Hold on. David, I think you. Yep, I'm going to stop sharing and give it back. All right. <laughs> Sorry about that. To Casey. This is Casey Gamboa. She's an experienced sales leader with a demonstrated history of working in office fit out. Um, and plug and play office and the plug and play office industry. She also has some uh, previous industry knowledge in broadcast television, media and video production, as well as business development. She is KMC Solutions Assistant Vice President of Enterprise Solutions. And take it away, Case. All right. Thank you so much for that uh, very nice intro, Sarah. So as you can see from our deck, the title is to return or not to return. Exactly what our poll has also projected to you and it's showing that many would want to stay home still, right? If you're doing work from home. And I can understand that because uh, the aim of this um, session right now, specific to my scope after David, is to show you the facts and the details that we have gathered. Perhaps some of it you've heard over the news, you've read somewhere, but we did the liberty of, you know, putting it together for you so that you can somewhat weigh in which wants to, which option to take. It's either you return and you stick with your um, work from home and just do your job from there. All right, so let me start off. So the pandemic is indeed becoming more real every day, right? With the increasing number of um, infected and sadly those who are really um, dying because of this um, virus. And as we have seen, we've been in our houses for almost two months now. And um, they have just announced the kind of extension of this quarantine again, although this time around they kind of called it MECQ, so which is just the modified version. So that will start somewhere um, May 15 and expected to end um, May 31st and hopefully the numbers will cooperate and that would lead us also to a GCQ and then moving forward to a mod uh, modified GCQ. So we're just hoping for positive things every day on the news. So if you can see, they're very limited in terms of transportation, although East MECQ would bring about changes in terms of more leniency when it comes to allowing people outside because with MECQ we'll be allowing more industries to be operating although these are not 100% allowed to be operational. Um, a lot of vehicles also will be allowed because they will be allowing shuttling services and even carpooling. So stuff like that will be um, uh, slowly or gradually allowed as we go through and transition to MECQ. And just to reiterate, only 50% of the workforce has been um, granted by the government to really uh, function again. And we are not going back to anything usual. So there's no more normal, no, no going back to normal because we have a new normal that we are trying to um, establish right now as we gradually and ease our way up to the MCQ. So um, it's sad that uh, we are seeing a lot of losses if we are checking the news um, in terms of economic losses. Um, right now, the, the prediction is that it will be somewhere almost 300 billion if we're seeing this in the long run and it can go up to uh, double digit trillions of pesos of losses so just imagine that right although we're still i think uh, doing better compared to other um, countries in there because this is a worldwide thing and so we're still um, in observance of what's gonna happen in the next uh, few days but despite the risks that we're seeing right now given by this pandemic many of us are still uh, pushing through and one thing as you can see from the poll that we have uh, shown earlier that they want to go back to work all right so maybe uh, some of them were between uh, torn between um, 
scared of their um, health issues or being scared of their financial uh, state as of the moment because not everyone are getting paid because there are people who are no work, no pay right now. So here are the top reasons actually that we have gathered for the people who want to go back to work or to their um, workplace. So basically, everyone wants to start the economy. We want to restart it. And some who are having like physical and mental issues, they want to go out because pretty much we are working inside their houses. We don't walk much. We don't do so much. We're always, most of the time, seated in our chairs, in front of our laptops, talking and doing our work. So that limits our physical um, work. And so um, the others who are very athletic, they are looking forward to going back to work so they can uh, move more. And for those who are sadly having like um, mental issues also, it's a big thing for them to actually go out, um, socialize, and interact with their teammates and people in their um, workplace. And of course, uh, most in, uh, importantly, that's connected with the economy right now. People wanted to, of course, maintain and provide um, income to their employees and to their families as well. So um, uh, I think what's uh, something that's really important also that's not exactly being highlighted by everyone because it's not a personal concern, but mostly a, per a concern of an employer, it's the cyber security issues. Because even though, let's say, your employer or your company is providing you an internet um, connectivity at home, it's not exactly secured of all the, you know, um, cyber crimes. So there are a lot since uh, 2019, there are like 43% of cyber attacks to uh, targeting the small businesses. So 64% um, of which are, you know, being attacked also by web-based or big-time hackers. So just imagine that. And then what more now, 20 20 having this uh, pandemic amidst all us so they're in the lookout of really getting a chance to to attack you we we may not exactly uh, understand uh, the the impact of those right now but our business owners are really feeling the impact of those um, security um, attacks so um, now what do we expect or what are we supposed to expect when we go back to work for those who opted or excited to go back to work what are the preparations being done in the offices by our employers, building owners, facility owners, and facility providers? So as you can see from the photos, this is an actual activity being done in one of a KMC or across all KMC sites, right? So this has been implemented since the outbreak of the pandemic. So aside from the usual cleaning that happens on a frequent manner, right now, um, hospital grade sanitation is being done and then it's uh, more frequent now everything is being sanitized being wiped with alcohol we are using um steaming so that we can make sure that everything or every corner in the workplace is safe for an employee to work on too also, um, social distancing is strictly being implemented, as you can see from the graph here. It's a very classic example of what we of what the service provider are usually sharing with the clients, because based from the recommendations from IATF, um, the interagency task force, and also by uh, a lot of uh, landlords, facility providers, they are recommending. Um, that 50% only of the workforce to go back to work and 50% if they can really work and they are uh, productive in their work from home setup, then might as well stay doing the, the, the work from their homes because um, it's still not secured. Again, our security here that everything is okay or back to actual normal is when uh, a vaccine is already um, discovered. And of course, the effective medicine for COVID-19 is already out in the market. So that's the only assurance. So right now, um, these are the common uh, recommendations being shared by um, the government agencies and the building owners, and also at least minimum one meter distancing on the seating arrangement. So what you can see from the desk right now, it's like an alternate seating arrangement. Again, that's a recommendation. But then again, these um, building owners are always saying uh, the companies or the employers would always have the liberty to execute their own strategies as to how they would really implement 
or adhere to the government mandated um, social distancing rules. So um, aside from those, uh, there are new um, implementation as well. If you would notice, some offices would have like biometric access systems that would require us to put our fingers in there and then it will read our fingerprints. Now, no more. Um, everyone is recommending to use the RFID system and there's some sort of issue on the supply of RFIDs because everyone's going that direction. So we want it touchless right now, the access, so that um, less contamination and for social distancing also from once you enter the lobby of your building there will be signages perhaps uh, floor markings that you would observe even inside the elevators there are markings as to where you can only stand up where you will be proceeding once you enter because what we are providing uh, our what we are promoting here is that we don't get to meet people on anything shorter than one meter when you go on a common space like the lobby or elevator. And of course, for those who have uh, seen some sort of symptoms of um, COVID-19, they will be uh, strictly required to do a 14-day uh, self-quarantine. But how do we know that? There are offices like us who are requiring to fill up some forms which ideally are supposed to be distributed a day before you go to the office, a day before you go back to your workplace, and declare everything that you would observe uh, within your body. If there are symptoms, if you have been exposed, and therefore we would coordinate and just advise that person to just stay at home and do a self-quarantine. So um, uh, we have heard a lot of buildings are also implementing the same. And of course, even though we think that um, fever is too late for us to determine that a, a person is indeed uh, uh, contaminated or um, is already sick, we still try to use those um, thermo uh, non-touch uh, guns so that we can still say that this person is beyond the normal temperature and therefore not allowed to enter the premises because not every one of us would know our actual temperature. I mean, one person may be still uh, strong, but then again, he doesn't know that he may be um infected already or maybe having some sort of a flu but we don't want to risk it so best practices of course is something that each and every companies and business owners are promoting right now even via virtual ads videos and then um group emails i'm sure everyone has been promoting how to properly wash their hands properly uh, do uh, personal hygiene and also of course contact tracing has been there since the start of uh, uh, the pandemic and now we are just uh, reiterating that it's still being implemented right now and right now what's popular is the virtual meetings digital um, interaction since we are limited uh, into doing meetings right now no more person-to-person uh, -person meetings only through um, uh, whatever applications that you guys are using within your um, companies. And even though we know that washing hands is still the best way to clean our hands, some of us wouldn't know how long we should be really washing our hands and how the proper way of doing it is. And also for the face mask. So um, yeah, for the, for washing your hands, it, it has to be uh, at least 20 seconds. That's why they're telling the kids to sing happy birthday twice while they are soaping their hands because that's the most effective that's when you can actually say that the bacteria virus or whatever in your hands are actually dead and of course your advice to really use some antibacterial antiviral uh, soap that you can have from the market and for the face mask it's not just a plain face mask there are face masks that are not exactly appropriate or it's not exactly doing its purpose so it has to be three ply and you have to wear it properly because others I, I think i'm seeing from tv also that they're they're using the mask but then again their nose are outside and not covered by the mask so that is still wrong because you're still exposing yourself you're just practically putting on masks but not exactly shielding yourself so the mask uh the three ply mask has to be some sort of uh purpose for aerosol not to get through it so you can test using your perfume or the other hand so if it did not go through it then it is indeed an effective uh, face mask mask but then if it gets through and you have to throw it away and you stop using it 
And so um, company shuttles is also something that a lot of companies are implementing right now. A lot of um, shuttle hiring companies are fully booked because since um, even though we are going through the MECQ, the transportation is delimited, no public transportation. And what's only allowed are public and private shuttling and carpooling. So. Uh, so that they can go back to work there, hosting their employees by uh, providing company shuttles. But it's not as easy as that because there are limitations also as to what the capacity of those um, vehicles are. So for those vehicles, vans, um, cars, it has to be first registered and we have to get like the permits from LTFRB or the Land Transportation Franchising Regulatory Board. So we have to secure that so that we can go past the, the what do you call this, the checkpoints. And then the seating arrangement has to also be some sort of um, alternating and has to be at least two meters away from each other. So later, I'm going to show you a graph that shows how it can be done. But then again, also bicycles and motorbikes can be, can be allowed. Given that, they're going to wear also the face masks and helmet. And of course, get the permit also from LTFRB. And um, at least two meters um, social distancing from another bicycle or another more motorcycle or e-scooter. So this is what I've been telling you. This is just a sample that we got from the website of IATF. Come GCQ, physical distancing is still need to be uh, observed inside the vehicles, right? If it's a van or if it's uh, like this, a bus. So you can see it's alternating. Even though it's a tricycle, I think uh, they've been talking if tricycle is going to be allowed, but there has to be only one passenger and then just the driver. So for sedan cars, if you're planning to do carpooling, as you can see from here, there's a driver, one passenger seat, and then just two at the back. That's the best. All right. And then when it comes to the offices, so I've mentioned to you guys like um, from the lobby itself of the building, there will be like strict um, social distancing measures, sanitation required, you have to get alcohol, sanitizer, and wipes. And when you come to your own facility, perhaps uh, all your companies will be requiring the same set or same level of sanitation. Even though you know that these employees has gone through the lobby sanitation, you will still require them to do the same thing because they went through the elevator, they, they happen to be side by side with uh, someone in the elevator. And so we have to go through the same steps. So let's not get tired of it. It's for our own good. So um, other companies are launching some apps um, just like how we did it in KMC. If you guys are familiar with Sims, I um, wasn't able to prepare a short video to show how it goes but it's like um, an, an e-learning tool also not just showing you what's new or what to expect in your um, facility but really teaching you how. It would even ask you, okay, once you get into your car, what are you supposed to bring? So you will say your mask, alright? So when you get down to the car, there are available masks at the Table, entrance, and the lobby. Are you going to get one, even though you have one? Okay, so you will answer. And then when you're wrong, Sims is going to provide you also the correct answer, right? And the equivalent danger if you answered it wrong. So things like that. It's a very um, infer uh, informative and um, I think that's um, it's a bit cute also and you won't get tired of just uh, going through the next one the next thing to go to and the next question to answer because it's quite fun it's interactive so I hope other companies are doing the same so that it is uh, very informative and very engaging to all other um, employees so um, I believe we it's not only KMCS who's doing this uh, frequency and mode of cleaning right now if before we're doing before um, uh, duty and then after duty of cleaning of the common areas now for frequently touched areas we're doing it on an hourly basis and that we are really doing it on a hospital uh, grade uh, level so um, this is quite an assurance for me like personally it's comforting to know that this is do being done in an hourly manner because we know for a fact that people come and go although we have been telling everyone to really, you know, stay where you are, 
and don't go so much so that the contact tracing is going to be easier and that it's really scary. So sometimes unconsciously, we tend to forget it. That's why also right now, even though you heard it somewhere else, we're doing the same thing. Uh, we're doing it repetitively and we're reiterating these things that we have to, to follow. And so not only that the facility has to be ready, not only that the building has to be ready, you yourself has to make sure yourself is ready. First and foremost, you have to check, are you healthy enough to go outside again, to expose yourself again? Because we are not 100% sure even though all sanitation exercises is being done. I mean, you have to travel to go to your office, point A to point B. So there's an exposure in there. Plus, people are going around. So we have to make sure and be responsible enough to follow everything from bringing your own face mask, a clean one, and then make sure you are taking your vitamins, you are eating the right food, you are sleeping well, you're in a good diet, and everything else. And then you self-assess your health and maintain always the physical distancing. And uh, so you're not limited to only going from your house to your office. Right now, there are a lot of other options. And exactly there, are, that's why there are a lot of facility providers available in the Philippines, if not in the world. So there's something that we call hub and spoke system or hub and spoke model that you won't be required. If this is something that your company would allow you to do, you would have your headquarters, right? Only a number of people will be really required to go to the HQ because the company will not exactly function without them. But then again, for the others like salespeople, admin people, we have to admit it, you can pretty much work from home, right? And so if you actually hate working from home because it's not exactly ideal for you, not comfortable, then I think um, this is the perfect time for us to enjoy the perks of being a subscriber if you already are, or if not, then explore being subscribed to a network of um, facility provider that has a lot of satellite offices around the Philippines. Because you won't be required to go to a specific office. They can still detect you via, uh, via tapping your RFID in the supposedly biometric system. And then you were still connected to a very good internet connection. And you will still be seated in a very nice office with a nice air conditioning system. But then again, you can still work um, properly like how you are working in your actual HQ and you're not going to be disturbed. You're not uh, exactly just boxed inside your house. So pretty much you're getting out of the house, but very limited exposure because we believe that a lot of people are actually commuting not one ride alone. There are people who would uh, have three transfers of rides for them to get to their offices. And so this hub and spoke system would allow them to go to their, uh, to the nearest satellite office to their house. So that's the idea of hub and spoke. So that's something that we can pretty much um, cater you with. So um, now we can talk about, uh, about here. So we pretty much identified all the dangers of going again to your um, workspaces or workplaces. So of course, for the employers, the employers would pretty much be afraid of their employees to be um, exposed again in the outside world because not everyone would have the symptoms. And what's the most dangerous of all is those asymptomatic and getting people um, infected, especially those who are not um, exactly healthy, right? And then, of course, limit limited transport, limit in moving would mean limited manpower and therefore slow down also in production. And then, of course, their workspace, they have to relay out it, they have to strategize it, and they have to do a lot of um, planning. And then for employees, of course, it's a struggle to go out because you have to arrange carpooling and you have to take turns. Even though you have uh, an assigned uh, shuttling, you know, um, it will take longer because each and everyone has to be picked up and be brought uh, to their own uh, homes. So uh, there are a lot of stops. So a lot of waiting game in there. So risk of in infection also. Not everyone is game to go outside and really risk it being exposed to the virus. And of course, um, for the economy, um, we are all afraid of having a second or third wave, right? So 
we don't want that happening. Just to summarize here, here are the um, sorry advantages and um, disadvantages uh, for you to see of staying at home. Now we're yeah we're tackling staying at home. So for the employers, of course, um, pretty much the same with the employees. Uh, less uh, exposure to the infection and we're secure that we can keep the employees and lower operational expense for the employees less exposure to infection again better usage of time because you don't have to wake up extra early get yourself ready the travel time you can use it for working early or extra hours and uh, of course uh, lower spending for them because you don't have to pay for your transport your food uh, outside because everything is pretty much uh, ready at home so their wives uh, can cook for them of course um, the disadvantage is you know further uh, loss of income and um, others are downsizing, if not closing down their business um, all in all. So slower in productivity is expected because, of course, half of the workforce is only expected to go back. And the supply chain itself is, is slow. And, of course, for the employees, there's a potential loss of jobs due to the income losses of the employers themselves. And right now, um, we cannot actually count now how many um, Filipino um, citizens are unemployed. And um, I'm, I'm nearing the end of my presentation. This pretty much sums up the general things that we have gathered or tips uh, for business uh, survival. I believe everyone um, is pretty much convinced that this year, 2020, is not a year for much of an earning. It's a year for mostly business uh, survival. As Jack Ma would advise um, his Chinese audiences in one of his uh, talks, so he says to retool, reflect, and restore work at a steady pace. So it's like um, yun nga, um, reshaping your business and thinking on how to somewhat tweak your business to be something of need at the moment. So exactly why there are like work from home service providers right now, exactly why people are highlighting flexibility of um, um, facility providers and offices because of the hub and spoke uh, system that's going to be really uh, a trend right now. So and also that uh, communication is the key. We have to stay in touch as everyone is working from home. We have to stay connected. We always have to hear the news and what's trending because every day uh, the news is changing. You know, the announcements, the rules and the limitations is quite changing fast. So we have to be really um, um, alert with the uh, announcement, both internal and external. And that everyone is campaigning for a more digital and virtual world right now because that's the only option because we're um, staying away from um, doing personal or face-to-face -face, um, meetings and talks. And it would really take a while for us to go back to that actual normal. And uh, for those who can really stay and do their work from home, then I think we can really suggest that we pretty much stick with that until we are all 100% confident enough to go in the outside world, that it is safe, that there is indeed uh, uh, medicine discovered and some vaccines ready, readily available in the market. And then for the business owners to really focus on retention of your employees and to just, you know, um, focus more on that, stop the bleeding. Perhaps you can come up with some programs. Share the love is something that we have implemented internally and it's been successful for those who are keeping Excuse their me, job. Casey, Casey yeah. we have to go on to the Q&A. You have to go to yeah, the sure. next slide. So please. yeah, I think that's, uh, that's uh, the end of my uh, presentation right now. And we leave it up to you guys to decide on whether to go back to work or stick with your work from home setup. Yeah, thank you for everyone for staying with us and listening to all of the presenters. We had two very different but equally informative talks. David providing um, a more innovative or an innovative and data-driven technology-based um, technology-based solutions that build and get smarter and more powerful as we collect more data. Um, so very interesting stuff there. And then Casey's presentation also as well, sharing best practices on what to do now uh, for the workplace and the employee. So um, you know we have strategies for the right now and for the immediate future. Um, I also want to quickly introduce, I, I want to get, get over to the Q&A so that you guys can ask your questions, but I'd like to just very quickly introduce our chairman and co-founder, Greg Kittleson, who you heard a, a moment ago. 
I'll turn it over now to the questions. All right. Are there effective work from home arrangements? Yes, I'll go ahead and take that. I mean, th there are some effective work and uh, work from home arrangements. I think what we're doing at uh, Kittleson, and, sorry, at KMC Solutions is pretty a blended model where I think Casey touched on it a bit before, where the hub would really be the um, office in the CBD. And then if you can have access to offices that are in the surrounding areas, the provincial areas or on the fringes of Metro Manila, where a lot of people live. So uh, KMC does have a blended model called uh, KMC CASA, which allows uh, our clients to work from any of the 24 co-working space locations throughout Metro Manila, Clark and Cebu, uh, as far north as Quezon City and Metro Manila and far as south as Alabang. And then we also can go into the home and set up a solid internet connection, uh, as well as hardware and software. So there is a work from home arrangement that could work, but I believe it's more of a blended model. I guess I'll, I'll take the, uh, the, the rules on COVID testing. The, the, there are several different ways of looking at COVID testing, and I think that it varies from sector to sector. Uh, for example, in the pogo industry, there was a requirement uh, for that sector that everybody perform a rapid antibody test before going back to work. In most of the other private sectors, uh, it's really up to the, uh, the company to determine how they want to approach this but the uh, uh, the general philosophy here is this that you're going to have to do antibody testing for people as a method of clearing them to try to prevent risk of infection in the workforce uh, PCR testing is still uh, limited uh, because the the capacity is not there so the laboratories are preferring that PCR tests only be done as confirmatory tests on individuals that are already indicative of either symptomatic lead to be positive or through antibody testing to be positive. Uh, the one other rule on antibody testing is it does need to be done under med medical supervision. And the reason is this, even though the finger prick test is not a medical test by itself, it could be something that people do on their own, the interpretation of the results is dangerous, right? And that goes back to the medical framework here that a negative or positive with the antibody test may not mean what you think it means which is why it's important to be done by either under the supervision of a doctor or a medical company like Xenia. The, it's important to have some way to form context around the results so that you don't uh, take the wrong decision based on the information that you get back. Uh, I can't see the other question. I think the, the, the next is also, will there be a shift in demand for telemedicine? Well, there's absolutely a shift in demand for telemedicine. I mean, the, uh, within the, the COVID economy right now, the majority of clinics are closed and many of them will continue to be closed. Uh, hospitals are an area you general, generally are not going to want to go and a lot of the non-COVID related areas are shut down. So for many people, there's not even a lot of good options to go into a clinic. Uh, and I think this is going to be continue to be the case. We're also in discussion with, we're coordinating with many of the medical facilities and quite a few doctors are themselves uh, have pre-existing conditions and nurses have pre-existing conditions. So, the same um, approaches that I was suggesting in my talk, where staff should be assessed for pre-existing conditions is being done by hospitals and clinics right now. And they're finding that there's doctors and nurses who would be at high risk if they were to see patients. So there's a general move both from the medical community to be to embrace online abilities. And there, there's a move from the, the general community to do so because first of all, there's not a lot of other choice. Uh, as we're also engaging with companies, we're finding there's a lot of interest in companies around corporate health and moving towards telemedicine in general to facilitate things like employee sick leave and uh, e-fitness to work and e-clearance to work. Because within the COVID context, it's a difficult question for companies to address. If somebody has been sick or they've been infected, can they come back, right? Uh, do they just show a note or would you rather have them go have a doctor that's connected to the company that does a telemedicine call and does you a digital certificate to clear the person? I think this is a really an important question that companies are going to have to address. I saw another question here. Since um, is COVID-19 testing mandatory in modified CQ for those returning to work? I, ha I haven't seen any indication that it's mandatory. Uh, I've never, I've, I've not seen any uh, government indication that's mandatory. I think it, I have seen within some sectors, sec certain sector organizations have declared that it's mandatory, 
but I have not seen that the government in, in large has declared that it's mandatory, right? It's, it's really a question of, uh, of safety and it, it comes back down to the data points. I think it's an important data point, but it's also just one data point. I've seen some companies put a lot of money into COVID testing, uh, but without the realization that you're gonna have to keep repeating it and also performing a COVID test without having some form of symptom test in advance, this just doesn't really make a lot of sense. How do you address the challenges of the emerging so-called new normal to adopt uh, a new work-life balance? David, I'll let you take that one too, and then I'll, I'll answer the question about the biggest impact on the pandemic uh, for KMC Solutions. So go ahead. Uh, well, you know, it, it sort of varies from, from place to place. I think in the U.S. they've seen something like a, an average of three hours per work increase by employees because, uh, because you have all this extra time. Uh, in the Philippines, uh, I think that, you know, it's a mixed bag because for a lot of work from home types, they're also not commuting as far. So, you know, the, it does provide some of that. Though I think it was brought up in the previous presentation from Casey that the uh, not being able to move around, not socializing is a big factor. So I think that it's it's going to be difficult. I mean, it's, it's easy when you're working from home and on Zoom calls all the time to not be very active. And that's also not healthy, right? So uh, in terms of work-life balance, uh, it's also nice in a normal situation to separate your work life from your home life. You know, if you're in the same living room doing your work calls, and then that's where you hang out as well, you sort of like lose that balance. So I think from a, uh, Casey also addressed mental health. From a mental and physical health standpoint, I think that's the challenge is you have to sort of be a little bit disciplined and set some time aside like a couple hours a day that this is my me time, right? Because otherwise it sort of all blends together. Correct. Sometimes you tend to abuse yourself, right? When you're in the momentum to work, you just can't stop it. <laughs> so again, yeah, that's a discipline we have to really learn. Yeah, I completely so, agree. Sarah, is it okay if I uh, grab one of these questions here? Um, so what is the biggest impact of this pandemic to service offices such as KMC Solutions. So, uh, you know, KMC Solutions, a very large player in the Philippines in terms of serviced office, co-working place and uh, co-working space and enterprise office. So, uh, you know, given the fact there's 26 locations, um, it puts us in a different, uh, it puts in a different situation as others. I think when you have some of these smaller companies, specifically startups that are geared towards the Philippine market, uh, unfortunately, it's questionable whether some of them are going to uh, live through this. We hope that they do. But considering it is the Philippines, a lot of uh, the clients that we have at KMC, uh, as well as the other flexible workspace providers, are IT BPO types. So they are back office. So there are some that are going to uh, potentially reduce in size, some that are going to uh, put some of the growth plans on, on hold. But then again, there are some clients like we have, uh, for example, Zoom. Uh, as you can imagine, Zoom is really uh, beefing up their workforce and they're doing a lot of it here in the Philippines. So we're hiring the staff for Zoom and putting them in, in our office. Uh, there's also gonna be a lot of companies which are looking for BCP. Uh, so they're gonna want an additional office given what has happened. So that uh, creates opportunity in the uh, flexible workspace market. What I spoke about before with this kind of hub and spoke where you are gonna have uh, employees working from the hub, which is in the CBD, whether Makati, BGC, or Artigas, but they're gonna want smaller co-working areas or smaller offices uh, in this, essentially the outskirts of Metro Manila, Cebu, uh, and then up in Clark as well. And that's something that uh, we are providing. Uh, there are some uh, companies, specifically the call centers that are gonna have to expand in space because they may not have uh, the one meter uh, rule uh, in their current environments. So uh, at KMC, our, our uh, workspaces, our desk are 1.2 meters. Um, but I do think some of the call centers are only one meter. So if they're one meter apart, you're not physically one meter. Two people aren't one meter apart. They're, they're a bit less than that. So they're going to have to reconfigure the office or the cubicles, spread them out a bit, which means they're going to need extra space. So kind of the, the long answer to that question. Uh, Greg, I'll, I'll take a question I see here for Xenia. Um, so the question was, if a company already has the test kits, will you still be able to provide nurses to do the test or do you prefer your own kits? 
you know, we, we can do the test if you have your own test kits. Uh, you know, we, we, we have some kits in stock. We carry specifically in Avita and Celex brands, um, but we will perform the tests for companies that have their own test kits. Uh, we do it digitally. The way it's so insane that it's different is we do a KYC with a mobile application. So we take a photo, we get a digital signature, and then we uh, scan the test as well because it's very important that the results are treated as a medical record. Um, and if you have the corporate health sort of package as well, then it's all correlated as part of that package I mentioned earlier, but it's possible without it. And yes, that's available uh, currently. Sarah, what other questions do you have? Um, I think you answered the one I was going to ask about the, the blended model. Um, the question was, do we have an option to go to any KMC location that's near our residents? And the answer is yes. Um, we can send some more information about if anyone is interested after this call. But let me look for another question. Um, yeah, in, in, in the interim, I'll just uh, expand on that a little bit. I mean, the, this kind of blended model or the KMC passport if you will, it really gives the opportunity for your employees to work from any of the 24 locations that we have. So we really wanna call it, uh, there's work from home, work in the office, and this is kind of work near home. You might be able to work in the office, uh, you know, sorry, you might be able to, if you're gonna not come to the hub or to the a CBD, uh, the larger office, and you wanna work from home partly, uh, but this also this, you know, work from home model with the KMC passport where you can go into any of the KMC co-working spaces, you know, get a real solid internet connection, uh, you know, good, good um, media there, um, you know, is very clean, very safe. Uh, so that's an option for uh, a lot of people and they can kind of collaborate with teams. So you may have, you know, various team members that are in the Par um, Paranaque, Las Piñas, Alabang area those uh, employees could actually meet, let's say, at a KMC uh, office in Alabama, which is right. essentially near home. Is it safe to use a UV lamp in sanitizing phones and other gadgets? Uh, we are using that at uh, KMC. We do have some uh, UV lamps that we are uh, sanitizing, but uh, I can let David expand on that as well. Well, the, uh, it's, it's, it's safe to use. That's not a question of safety. Is it effective is the better question. Uh, and I think that the, there's certain kinds of UV lamps that are more effective than others. So it's, it's really a question of the wavelength that they use and the effectivity of it. The, the really good ones are really expensive. So um, I, I would use it as a sort of, unless you have a, an excellent professional grade one, I would use it as a secondary form of uh, cleansing. Yeah, correct. Is an e-option because of the lower penetration of smartphones and network congestion? Not sure what, what kind of e-option are we talking about? Uh, work from home or? Uh, I think it's, yeah, I think it's referring to work from home. Let me answer that one. So work from home doesn't necessarily mean that we'll be doing or using wireless connection. So there's a fiber optic uh, option that we can do. And a lot of our telcos are providing those. And exactly as Greg has mentioned, KMC has that kind of service also, uh, CASA, that would allow you to have like a complete work from home setup with 50 Mbps connectivity internet, just like how some of the offices are providing you the same level of connect connectivity. So our telcos right now are pretty much capable of providing you good internet connection. So you just have to choose from the array of services and packages that they have. Okay. Uh, I think that's a good question there um, uh, about the test kits. Uh, do you see that one, Sarah, uh, from Sheila, 504? <laughs> So I, I'll go ahead and read it, sorry. If if a company already has the test kits, will you be able to provide them? I think I, I answered that one. Oh, okay, sorry. Oh, yeah, yeah. If any, uh, other questions of, uh, um, maybe we can do one more question. Can employers mandate COVID-19 testing for their employees and who will shoulder the cost? Sorry, the question David. 
Can employers mandate it? Is that the question? Yeah. Can employers mandate COVID-19 testing for their employees and who would shoulder the cost? Yeah, I think uh, employers can mandate it. I mean, the employers have the ability to mandate uh, a number of requirements to restrict. And in fact, what we're seeing is uh, they can and they probably should uh, because ultimately it's for the, they're responsible for the protecting the safety of their overall community of workers. Uh, in terms of who's shouldering the cost, so far what we've seen is generally it's the companies that are shouldering the cost. And uh, the, uh, it's, it's simply being cycled as a part of doing the business. It's um, uh, it, the average cost that tests themselves anywhere from around 500 pesos to 1500 pesos. The average cost of the administration test depends on whether or not you're doing it in a group or home. If it's home, it might be six or 700 pesos. If it's in a group setting, it might be 100, 200 pesos. Um, but I think that the way some companies are looking at this is trying to strategize who gets those tests. Meaning that as you look at your workforce, you segregate out the people that have to be in the offices. And actually, in fact, you also look at the industries. For example, if you're in a manufacturing industry, uh, somebody getting, becoming infected and entering the, the, the factory can infect several others and take the entire factory down. So the cost of loss of business is massive. Whereas in a BPO center, maybe it's not as massive if you've got a lot of people who can also work from home. So one way to look at it is from a risk standpoint uh, in terms of the company itself. The other way is to look at it from a uh, risk standpoint in terms of, is this an employee that is often highly engaged with others and comes in contact with 50 or 100 people a day, or is this an employee that's relatively uh, segregated? In fact, one of the requests we've had from some of the companies we're working with is to use contact tracing uh, again, anonymously, just to identify risk by frequency. You know, are there some people that come into contact much more frequently than others? And then let's isolate those and test, right? Uh, another way of looking at things is anytime someone has been identified from contact tracing as being at risk, you then go ahead and test them. Or if they've been symptomatic, you test them. So there's, there's a variety of strategies that have to be used because it is expensive. Um, but we haven't seen any companies yet try to uh, have the employee shoulder that. Are there any other questions maybe that I missed from the panelists um, that you'd uh, um, There's definitely a number of people asking for the presentations. David, would you like to provide your presentation? Yeah, I can, uh, I can segregate it and provide it, the PDF. Definitely. And I think on the KC side as well, we're more than happy to share, to share the information with you. Um, I suppose if that's all, we don't want to keep you too I do see another question that I think we can, so this, this might be a good one for you guys as well, but uh, uh, someone asked, how can you be sure that the employee working from home is really working? <laughs> uh, I, there, there are actually, I mean, that's a good question. It's two things. I think that uh, I do believe that work from home is going to become part of the new normal moving forward. Uh, there are going to be more flexible arrangements. I think one is a management style. I mean, I, I come from the perspective of um, uh, many of my team have been distributed for years. so. Uh, part of what you have to evolve is a work management style that focuses on deliverables and using collaboration platforms to be able to track what's done. So you focus more on, you know, things being done within those platforms rather than in, in meetings. Um, and there are also tools available out there that do things like they they watch the keystrokes and they take videos and they, they, they take snapshots of their screen at intervals. I mean, depending on the level to which you want to monitor, um, they, there are tools available out there that do that. I mean, so there's definitely some challenges from working uh, from home in the Philippines, which is the obvious. One is the uh, internet connection. And then the other would be, um, you know, the surrounding uh, activities which are happening in somebody's home or outside, you know, whether it be dogs or roosters or, uh, you know, somebody cooking in the kitchen uh, that you're next to. So, um, you know, from what I understand in the uh, IT uh, BPO call center industry now, there's uh, about 40% of the com of the employees of companies uh, working from home, 10% are working uh, from the office and 50% are essentially on the sidelines. Now, a lot of that is made up of the call center industry, which of course you, you can imagine cannot work from home given the spotty internet connection because you need solid voice and the noise pollution around, but as well as the uh, um, uh, privacy issues. So uh, I'm definitely a big uh, uh, advocate of uh, getting back to the office, back to work. 
Hey, Greg, Greg, I do have one comment I want to make on the theme, the, the to, to return and not to return, especially since there's so many that said let's not. Um, <laughs> from, a, from a healthcare standpoint, I think there is a common misconception. I don't really believe that two weeks or four weeks is going to make a difference in terms of the curve. You know, I think the reality is we could still lock down for another two months and we'd still get that second wave. Um, even in Korea, which had extreme measures around tracing and identifying, there was recently a case where uh, someone went out to one of the pubs and infected 15 people. So the, the intent of the initial lockdown was to lower the curve so that we could catch up and be ready. It was never to stop and it's not going to stop. I think some people are under the false impression that if we sort of stay in our holes long enough that it'll go away. That's not going to happen. So uh, from my perspective, I think we should get ready to go back as fast as possible and just move on because I think a lot of people are not realizing the economic impact is, is, is probably even worse. I mean, the reality is that the longer we stay down, the more businesses go out of business, the more people have no money, then they're going to die from other reasons. Right. So COVID is one, one, one reason for debt. And actually in the Philippines, if you look at the statistics I shared, for the elderly, that's a very small segment of the population. I'm not saying that that means we shouldn't care about them. It's just there's not as many of them, so it's not going to be as prevalent. Uh, and again, I want to highlight one thing, which is, uh, in case you mentioned this in her presentation about staying healthy, um, while I think that's a great goal, it takes time to you know get rid of all the extra weight you may have put on, uh, especially when you're stuck at home. Uh, I do think that people are going to have to be very health conscious moving forward and, and identify. As we've been engaging, engaging companies, a lot of companies are interested in our COVID testing. A lot of companies are interested in our workplace safety program, protect the perimeter. There's been almost zero interest in pre-existing conditions. So no one seems to be very interested in trying to figure out if their workers have pre-existing conditions. And I think that's a fundamental misunderstanding, right? Because we are going to get this. A lot of us are going to get this. That's not the point, right? The point is to be, protect the ones who are at highest risk and I don't see anybody doing that right now, right? So I think it's very important to sort of really focus on the real issue here, which is a lot of us are going to get COVID. It's going to happen. The whole point of all this was to prepare for that and to make sure that we can take care of those who do get it and are at most risk not to avoid it. It's not really avoidable. So um, I just wanted to add those comments and perspectives uh, in, in terms of the, the alignment. We should be looking at how to go to work, not when to go to work, right? And for me, it's not a question of do we go or not, we go, we should go right now, but it's how. We should, we should go and be prepared, use the time that we've had off to be very prepared to go in. All right, any remarks or any other comments that, uh, from Craig or from Casey that you wanna leave the audience with or? No, I just think we're all uh, ready to get back to normal life. And a lot of us are, well, well I'm in the office. I come to the office every day, but I, I live and work in BGC, so it's easy. But I think uh, a lot of us uh, are ready to get back to the office. And I think that's a good thing, but uh, it needs to be done uh, in a very uh, safe way. I mean, companies need to take it upon themselves to protect their employees. And, um, you know, if you're looking for a very good uh, tech uh health platform, uh, corporate health platform, Xenia has it. And if you're looking for a great office space, KMC has it. Yeah, I agree. It's just a matter of um, being aware and being prepared. So we have to wear also the discipline. So it's not about when to go to work, but it's about how to go to work, just how David has mentioned it. So it's, it's for us to decide on how we do it and how we manage ourselves and our people also. So we leave it to all participants who, who participated with us here in the webinar. Thank you very much. David, any last comments? Uh, uh, none from me. I think I made, just made those. <laughs> so, uh, so, so David and, and Casey, I think a lot of people are asking for the presentations. If uh, there's a way we could share that. Yep. Yeah. Oh, yeah, sure. Uh, sure. Uh, I, I'll send the presentation. I guess Greg would coordinate through you. Just one last comment from my, my end. Uh, if anybody is interested in the, in the workplace uh, safety solutions, you can just go to Xenia.com and, and take a look at some of what we have. Um, uh, we're, we're engaging several companies in, in, in sort of the overall end-to-end -end healthcare solutions right now. Yep. Thank you, everyone, for and answer. Um, we hope to get back to you on those questions. Um, if you'd like us to continue.
connect you to one of our speakers or um, we'll be sending you all of the, the, the materials after this as well as the recording. Um, thank you so much for, for spending the afternoon with us or whatever time it is, wherever you are. Um, we all hope that you can stay safe and healthy and we hope that this was very informative for you and it equips you with the knowledge that, you know, with new knowledge to help you um, get back to work quicker, safer. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Bye.